Hey guys, how you doing? I think the lighting's pretty good, right? Everything good? Good, just let me know the sound is good, All right? Let me know the quality is good. Again, I want you to pray and praise the Lord Jesus Christ and thank the Lord Jesus Christ for child of God, being a gracious brother who loves Jesus, who allows me to come to his house and use his internet connection and doesn't charge me a dime. He does it out of love for Jesus because he believes in this ministry and wants me to be used of Jesus Christ to glorify his name and bless the people of God. So keep praying for child of God, his family. They're very gracious. They even let me come here when then when they're not here. Lord Jesus, have mercy. You know, I it, one thing I've noticed, it's like Satan doesn't stop either to just start trouble, start attacking on my comment section, or ask me insincere questions. Questions in order to try to show off and impress me that they're knowledgeable. But when I expose the fallacy in their arguments, then they get angry or they press the point only to embarrass and humiliate themselves. You don't know how many people I end up blocking. And one of the reasons why I block people, just to let you know, look, I know what my issues are. I know what my struggles are. I know what my imperfections are. If I know that you're going to cause me to stumble because I'm weak in an area, then I'm going to block you because I don't want to stumble and sin and grieve the spirit. I pray Jesus Christ saves me and gives me the power to constrain myself, but I'm not there yet. So this is, again, I take Jesus' parable. The one says, pluck out your eye or cut off your hand. Obviously, that's hyperbole. He doesn't mean literally pluck out your eye. But I take that to mean remove anything and everything in your life that will cause you to sin and stumble, Right? And grieve the Holy Spirit, grieve the Lord Jesus, right? So anything in your life, if there's something you're seeing that's causing you to sin, cut that off. If you are going to a certain place that's causing you to sin, cut that off. That's what it means. So what I do is if I know there's someone who's going to cause me to stumble, cause me to sin, then I cut off communication for my own spiritual health so I don't stumble and anger the Lord Jesus and grieve the Holy Spirit, right? So anyway, we have some guy who thinks he's smart and he's a genius, house dog, which I call him house toilet. I just told him to come join me. I said I'm live. So I'm hoping house toilet show, shows up to expose how pathetic his argument was because he wasn't asking me to learn. He was asking me to try to show off like he's knowledgeable, right? Those are the most pathetic people. Those who think they know and ask questions because they don't want answers. They want you to agree with them. They'll say, see, look, I'm smart too. Arrogant, pathetic, pathetic human beings. Pathetic excuses for Christians. So I'm going to call him house toilet, not house dog. So I'm waiting for him, hopefully. Right? Exactly, Mickey Afrata. Yeah, exactly, Lisa. House Dog 101. I'll call him House Toilet 202. The guy insists that he's right, no matter how much I try to show he's wrong. So I just told him, show up. So let's see if he'll show up. He has the guts to show up. And when he didn't like that I exposed him, then he attacks my personality. Your impatience is your downfall. Spoken like a filthy dog, you see? Now you guys wonder why I'm so angry, right? So House Toilet, I'm calling you out. Don't call yourself a house dog because you're the toilet in the house, not a dog in the house. Come on, wherever you are, come out, come out. Where You remember that movie, Warriors? Warriors, come out to play. House toilet, come out to play. Uh, he calls uh, Christian, he calls himself house dog. You see again the humbleness? He's trying to be humble. This is humbleness that's really arrogance and pride, nasty pride masquerading as humbleness because he's saying, see, I'm that house dog. You know, I'm that puppy in the house. That's all I'm good. See, arrogant, nasty, pride, wicked agent, use of the devil to pretend to be humble and a Christian. It was a matter of time he exposed himself. You don't catch the name, right? What house dog means? You guys don't see? How humble of you to call yourself a house dog. See, I want you to know I'm humble because of my humbleness, I'm going to show you I'm humble. 
Lord Jesus, have mercy on us. Lord Jesus, save us. Lord Jesus, save us first from our own flesh. Lord Jesus, save me from my flesh. Lord Jesus, we beg you, we beseech you, because you are a good God. You're a beautiful God. You're a holy God, a loving, compassionate, and merciful God. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for being patient with us. But help us, Lord Jesus, to be patient with each other. Save us from our imperfections and our sinfulness. Save me from my flesh. Whatever it is that grieves you, Lord Jesus, save me from unrighteous anger, impatience, lack of self-control, crucify our flesh, mortify our flesh, destroy our flesh, Lord Jesus, and fill us with your presence, with your love, with your power. Fill us with the Holy Spirit. Empower us by your Spirit to crucify our flesh, to walk in the life of the Spirit, to be filled with the fruit of the Spirit, and constrain us by your Spirit so we don't grieve you, Lord Jesus. Fill us with love, especially me, to love your church truly. Serve your church truly for your glory, Lord Jesus, not for the praise of men and not to be unnecessarily offensive. Lord Jesus, bless this session. Save us from distractions of Satan. Please, Lord Jesus, cover us with your precious blood, the blood of the Lamb. Shield us by your blood and our loved ones. Shield our, our family members, my daughters, by your blood, Lord Jesus. Shield us and seal us by your Spirit. Anoint the words of my mouth to speak clearly and accurately without error for your glory, Lord Jesus. Interpret scripture correctly and bless them, Lord Jesus. Bless your people who are listening. Fill them with wisdom and knowledge and power and holiness and faithfulness, Lord Jesus. And help us to be doers of your word, Lord Jesus. Increase in us, Lord Jesus. Sit upon our hearts. Our hearts are your everlasting throne. And the hearts of my daughters belong to you, Lord Jesus. Provide for our daily bread. And give us the grace to love you more, to be more like you, to be more bold and holy and loving, and in my case, compassionate, merciful, and patient. To live for you and to die for you, Lord Jesus, because we cannot love you enough. We cannot do enough to thank you, to honor you, Lord Jesus. Help us not to shame you, Lord Jesus. And Lord Jesus, save us from the evil one, please. We need your power to be delivered from Satan and his children and his corrupt, wicked, evil, fallen system. Lord Jesus, help us not to be afraid, but to trust in you and revere you. Please, Lord Jesus, anoint <clears throat> the sound of my voice to be pleasing to the ears of your servants, Lord Jesus. Fill my lungs and chest and throat with the breath of life, the health I need to do this, Lord. You don't need me, and I know this. You don't need me. We need you. I need you, and it's honor that you would use me. And in spite of my imperfections, Lord Jesus, continue to use me for your glory, because I cannot imagine life. We cannot imagine life without you. We need you. You are our life. You are the reason why we exist. And we love you, Lord Jesus. You are the Father's heart, his beloved son, his only begotten son, who became flesh in Jesus' name. Amen. Yahweh, Father, Son, and Spirit. Yahweh, Father, Son, and Spirit. Yahweh, Father, Son, and Spirit. Right. Yep, it's incredible, Alex Matos. Make sure to get the patterns of evidence on Moses writing the Torah. That's going to be amazing and silence the lies, the misinformation by liberals and skeptics who won't tell you this evidence that destroys their attacks against the Bible. In Jesus' name, Yahweh, Father, Son, Lord, bless the internet connection. Alex, make sure you get the other, the other part in the series, Patterns of Evidence, on Moses writing the Torah, because this man is providing the historic archaeological evidence destroying the lies misinformation of skeptics and liberals, use of the devil, hiding this overwhelming amount of information that proves the Exodus is a historical fact and that Moses wrote the Torah. You got them both, right? Mike, mine's is coming today. And don't forget February 18, Phantom Events, the first part of the evidence to provide that God did split the Red Sea and Israel walked on dry ground. The evidence that they've been hiding from us, right? May the Lord Jesus... Unveil this evidence to the world, leaving them with no excuse to believe the Bible is historically accurate and that it is his word. Right? So, guys, support those DVDs, show them and pass the links on to others because we need this information. You know, it's even tragic. You have Jewish scholars, some of them rabbis, they're conservative, or I'm sorry, they're reformed, who even will tell you that the Exodus is not a historical event. It did not happen. It's a fictional story. I mean, how can you be a Jew, especially a Jewish rabbi, and deny your sacred history that singled you out and made you a nation? 
Yep. That's what it is. Sad, isn't it? We'll wait a few more minutes by the grace of God. Hopefully we get the regular show up yesterday. We had a good crowd. Hopefully we'll have more. Yeah. No, but you have sec secularized Jews, medic, and you have reformed Jews who are like the liberal branch of Judaism, like you have liberal Protestantism, who will say that the Old Testament is myth. There's some historical events that took place, but the Exodus is a myth. And they even question whether Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob actually existed. Yes, uh, I think that would be it. No, yes, yes, all right, part one. I think that's it, Terp. If it says patterns of evidence, Exodus, yes. He came out with one showing the historical archaeological evidence that <clears throat> demonstrates the patriarchs existed. There was a foreign leader in Egypt who was honored that fits the description of Joseph and so on and so forth. That's the gentleman, Hosanna. How did you know? That was the rabbi I had in my mind because he's often featured in these liberal shows, liberal programs, right? Liberal shows and liberal programs where he questions the historicity of his own Hebrew scriptures. Exactly, Hosanna in the highest. Rabbi David Wolf. Amen. That's the one, exactly. He's a rabbi. Here, folks, here's what I don't get. If you don't believe the Bible is historically accurate and it's inspired word of God, why then are you a rabbi? Why then are you a pastor? Why then are you a priest? And why are you teaching the Bible? You don't believe in it. Right? Why are you a pastor? Why are you a priest? Why are you a rabbi? Go find something else to do. If you want to be a professor at a secular liberal college or university and just teach the Bible as literature, okay, just like me, I can do a class on the Quran. I don't believe the Quran is the word of God because it's not. Muhammad is an antichrist. The Quran is a false book, right? But I can still teach the, what the Quran says. In other words, here's what the Quran claims. Here's its theology, right? So on and so forth. I'll teach it as, you know, literature. Although there are people who believe this is sacred. It's not. It's of the devil. But that's that's one thing. But I'm not going to go and become an imam, right? I'm not going to go and become an imam at a mosque if I don't believe the Quran is the word of God. So why are you a rabbi teaching in a synagogue when you don't believe, when you don't believe the Bible is sacred history, historically accurate in the word of God? Why are you a pastor at a church when you don't believe the Bible is inspired word of God? Historically accurate, or a priest for that matter. Why? Why are you teaching in a church? Why are you pastoring a church or a synagogue? You get my point? Thank you, David Julius. I hope you liked it. That was one of those early ones I did. And again, guys, I want you to thank God and praise God for the mods, and especially Protestant believer in first and last. Protestant believer spent time sacrifice his own time to take the entire series I did with Al Fadi and Sir International and our Tawheed, Tawheed Dilemma, combined it into one and now uploaded it to my YouTube channel. And he's doing this at his own expense, at his own cost, taking away time from his family. And he doesn't get paid from me. His reward is the Lord Jesus. So thank him. I can't thank him enough or first, last, and the other mods. Thank them. So we're about to begin in Jesus' name. All right. Sorry about that. Hold on. I guess house dog, a.k.a. house toilet, doesn't have the courage to show up. Okay. So, folks, let's prepare you for the session because there's a few points I want to make, a few questions I want to answer I didn't get to yesterday. So are we ready? In Jesus' name, Lord Jesus, bring your crowd, Lord, please, Ya Allah, for your glory. Let's see if we can get over 150 like we did yesterday. Right? For his glory. May keep me humble and, and teachable. Right? Let's see. Okay. Some questions I want to answer. Number one, someone asked me, does the Holy Spirit have a throne or does he share the throne of God? The one who asked me that question yesterday. <clears throat> are you here? Someone here that asked me that question? I remember someone asked me the question yesterday. 
Lord bless you too, Titiunin. I don't know how to pronounce your name. It's a rough name. Okay. I wonder who it was. I, I caught their name yesterday and I forgot. But anyway, that's a good question. This will then lead me into a second question, second point I need to make, okay? The filioque. Now, for those of you who are Protestants and haven't interacted Roman Catholics or the Orthodox or even the Coptics or the Nestorians and haven't, let's say, listened to or read books on church history, you may not know what the filioque, filioque is. Now, the Orthodox know it and the Roman Catholics know it. Now, for the Protestants, what happened here? For the Protestants, what happened here, man? I'm trying to, hold on. Why is it not working? Okay. For the Protestants, does anyone know what the filioque is? Does anyone know? Protestants, not Orthodox, not Roman Catholic. You'll know this. Okay. Filioque is and of the Son. In the Nicene Creed, in the Nicene Creed, when it was originally composed, it said, and I believe in the Holy Spirit, right? But then that was in 325. Later on at the Council of Constantinople 381, when they debated the issue of the Holy Spirit, they add further statements to the Nicene Creed. So in the Nicene Creed, if you read it, you'll read it says, I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who together with the Father and Son is worshipped and glorified, who spoke through the prophets, and who proceeds from the Father. Okay? Now, I didn't give it to you in the exact order that's it's in the creed. But if you look at the Nicene Creed, you'll see it says, I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who spoke through the prophets, right? Who together with the Father and Son is worshipped and glorified, who proceeds from the Father. Later on, later on, the Western Church, what you would call the Roman Catholic Church, added the clause, who proceeded from Father and the Son. Filioque means and the Son. Now, the Eastern Church, the Orthodox Christians, the Nestorians, the Church of my Ancestors, though they were wrongly labeled Nestorians, and I believe even the Coptics, reject that addition. They don't say the Holy Spirit proceeded from the Father and the Son. They say he proceeded from the Father alone. Now, when it's talking about the Holy Spirit proceeding, it's not saying the Spirit being sent from the Father into the world to accomplish the salvation of the people of God or to do the work of God in the world. Okay? When it says who proceeds from the Father, it's saying that the Holy Spirit's deity, his divine essence, right, comes from the Father as its source. Remember what I said yesterday. According to early church history, which was the view of the church as a whole, God the Father is the source of the divine nature. God the Father is the source of deity. The divine nature, the divine attributes originate from him. He is the source, the single source of deity, divinity, divine nature. The Son and the Spirit's deity is the deity of the Father that originates from the Father, which they fully share in eternally and inseparably. This was the belief of the church fathers. This was the belief of the church you with me there? This is where now you need to listen. Follow with me so I don't confuse you. And if you're getting confused, ask me to clarify. All right? So how did they distinguish the Son from the Spirit? They looked at the language of Scripture. They saw that Jesus is the Son, but the Spirit is never called the Son. He's the Spirit. So from those names, those titles of the two divine persons, they concluded that Jesus, like a son, is begotten of the Father, but the Spirit is breathed out by the Father. It proceeds from the Father, breathed out from the Father. But God is not a physical being, so it's not physically breathing out. They use the word breath metaphorically to refer that, like when you breathe, that breath comes out of you, the Spirit comes out of the Father. And that Spirit is eternal, inseparable from the Father. So the Spirit's deity is the deity of the Father, and he's the source of that deity that the Spirit shares in. Do you understand what they're trying to say? They're trying their best to explain an eternal reality that's beyond human comprehension. 
Okay? But do you understand what it means? Before I move on? Because I want you to get this point. No, Mickey Afrata, no, 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 no. It doesn't make sense because you're still not understanding the issue. You again are speaking in terms of the spirit coming to us in the world and creation to save. Yes, the spirit comes from the Father through the Son on behalf of the Son, and the Son sends the spirit from the Father to us in the world to convict us, save us, transform us. That's not what I'm talking about. Pay attention to what I just said again. The Holy Spirit's deity. What is the source of his deity, his divine nature? Is the source of his deity the Father and the Son or the Father alone? What has it got to do with older George Wagner? Why are you introducing time again? Yeah, the economic trinity versus the ontological trinity. I'll get into that. You understand my point? So the question is, the divine nature of the Holy Spirit, is that the divine nature that the Father is the source of, or is that the divine nature, right, <clears throat> coming from the Father and the Son? In other words, is there a single source of the divine nature that the Spirit shares in, namely the Father, or is there a joint source of that divine nature that the Spirit possesses, the Father and the Son? You understand what the issues were? Complicated issues, issues that the church fathers tried to understand from their reading of the Bible. Now, many today disagree with their conclusions, their understanding, interpretation. So that's why you have people like William Lane Craig, even a guy named Stephen Hayes from Triablog, that deny this language and say it's outdated language, outmoded language. We shouldn't talk that way. We shouldn't talk about the Son being begotten and the Son the Spirit proceeding. I disagree with them. They are smarter than me, sharper than me, but I disagree with them because I see enough evidence in the Bible to show that the church fathers are right, and this has been the belief of the church historically up until at least, you can say, you know, let's say 20th century. I'm sure there were dissenters before that. Okay, but you understand what the issue is? You understand what the issue is? The divine essence of the spirit, the source of that divine essence, is it a single source? Is it the Father's the source of the divine essence that he and the Son and the Spirit fully possess? Or is the source of the divine essence that the Spirit possesses the Father and the Son together? I reject the filioque. I know Roman Catholics and Western Christians will be upset at me. I see enough evidence in the Bible, and I see that this was the possession of the early church. The Father is the source of the divine essence alone. Don't ask me about books right now. If you ask me about books, you're not paying attention. Pay attention. I want you to learn. So I agree that the Eastern Church, the Orthodox Church, the Nestorian Church, the Church of my ancestors, were right who proceeds from the Father. And even the Western Church will admit that clause and the Son was added later. And by the way, you have Orthodox Christians here, and they're going to confirm what I'm about to say. In 1054 AD, the Orthodox Church broke off from the Roman Catholic Church, the Western Church, and one of the reasons they broke off was over the filioque, this clause. They broke off because they said the Western Church is wrong for saying the Spirit proceeds from the Father and the, and the Son. You with me there? That was one of many reasons. Well, George Wagner, if Jehovah is not the source of deity, then who is? If Jehovah is not the source of deity, then who is? Okay. Who is confused? Because I want to go into some of the passages. I'm trying my best to go slow and be as clear as possible, trusting the Spirit to enable me to be successful. Jojo, I love you, my brother. You know that I love you. And in Jesus' name, I give you grace to be patient because I, I need Jesus to be patient with me. Jojo, which part of one of the reasons? When you hear one of the reasons, that means there's more than one, right? 
George Wagner, I'm confused. Is Jesus the Father? Since the Father is Jehovah, is Jesus the Father because he's Jehovah? See, I don't know what you're asking me. The Father is Yahovah, Jehovah, Yahweh. So is the Son, so is the Spirit. But in the Godhead, in the Godhead, which of the persons of the Godhead is the source of deity? Are all three of them the source of deity? Or is one of them the source of deity? Okay. Scott, you're asking me a question that I just addressed earlier. When it comes to God's relationship to creation, God's relationship to the world, and bringing about the salvation of the world, right? The Father sends the Son through, I'm sorry, the Father sends the Spirit through the Son, and the Son sends the Spirit from the Father to us in the world. That's not what we're talking about. You want me there? The same way as of the Son. Through the Son, that means the divine essence that the Spirit possesses comes from the Father through the Son. Right? That means the Son also is involved in communicating in a timeless manner the deity of the Holy Spirit. But it doesn't say through the Son content. It says who proceeds from the Father and the Son. Filioque doesn't mean through the Son. You guys are too confused. I think we're going to have to do now more than a second session because you're still not getting it. Okay. Let's try this again. Why are you Christians referring to passages from the Bible that talks about the Father sending the Spirit into the world? This is now about the fifth time I said it. And I'll say it again. I know it's complicated. We are not talking about the Spirit being sent into the world to accomplish God's will and creation. We're talking about the Spirit's eternal relationship to the Father and the Son before creation. Stop quoting passages that have nothing to do with the Spirit's eternal relationship with the Father and the Son before creation because the passages you're quoting are about the Spirit's work in creation. They're not the same. How you doing, Eliza? How are you doing? Everyone with me or no? So you guys, I hope you don't get bored or tortured that I take my time going slowly because you see there are many Christians. We're confused about these issues. Do you know why we're confused about these issues? Because churches are not teaching doctrine. Churches are not teaching systematic theology. Churches are not teaching about the historic beliefs of the early church. This is why it takes so much work and time for me to explain these things. Because for most of you, these things are shocking. You've never been told. You've never heard. And like, what's going on? Right? But you have what we call liturgical churches, the Orthodox, the Roman Catholic, the Coptic historians, that do teach these things. Because they still believe them. And you have churches that have men of God who do teach these foundational core doctrines and church history. I'm going to mention one by name. James White is an elder of the Phoenix Reformed Baptist Church, taught these doctrines to the members, and he's now doing it in Apologia Church. So there are those few churches and few men who, who are teaching the members of their churches these core essential truths. You get my point? You see how much time it's taking for me to unpack this because... Sorry, guys, buffering. Right? Thank you, Liza. God bless you for your support. Okay, I'm not angry at you guys. I'm angry at the pathetic state that Western Christianity is in. The pathetic state of the Western church. I'm angry at that. 
What are the pastors doing? You are pastoring churches, some of you mega churches. You're making hundreds of thousand dollars a year, living comfortable lives in comfortable homes. Why aren't you teaching the body of Christ the basics? Did you know in the early church, you had to go through intense catechesis? Catechesis means instruction before they. What can I do? We have to tolerate it, right? Let me see. Sorry. Sorry, guys. It's buffering. It's beyond my control. Okay. Now, did you know in the early church you had to go through intense instruction called catechesis? And those who were being catechized, instructed, were called catechumen. Let me give you the word. See, even this word I'm sure you haven't heard, right? Catechesis. Right? Let me see if I'm spelling correct. Man, all these words we got to learn. Hold on. Yep, catechesis. Catechism. Catechism means instruction. Like the catechism of the Catholic Church. Those who are being instructed are catechumen. Okay? Catechized. Okay. You would have to go through catechesis instruction to know what the faith is. And then once you're done and you believed it and affirmed it and now had a solid grasp of the core doctrines of Christian faith, you'd be baptized. Do you know that? In fact, help me out. I believe it's Cyril or Cyril of Jerusalem. He has what's called catechetical lectures. He wrote the series of instruction for prospective converts of the Christian faith, and you can read it online for free. This tells you what they were teaching converts at that time. Here, let me get it for you. And I do believe it's Cyril of Jer Jerusalem. Because there's two Cyril, Cyril of Alexandria and Cyril of Jerusalem. It's online. Let me get it for you. Thank God for modern technology. All their writings are online for free. Okay, let me get it for you. Yep. Cyril of Jerusalem, catechetical lectures. Here you go. Here you go, folks. Here you go. There you go. Right there. Notice it's called catechetical lectures. These were the talks he gave instructing prospective converts on what the doctrines of Christianity happened to be, what they were supposed to believe, how they were supposed to pray and worship and so on. And once they finished it, then they'd be baptized and be considered believers. You want me there? Everyone there? I just want to make sure you're getting this. Now, for those of you who go to churches, can you give me a name of any church that does catechesis where they bring in prospective converts and they make sure everyone goes through intense instruction on what Christianity is, what are the doctrines of the Christian faith, why you're supposed to believe them, and how you're supposed to live. See? See what the Roman Catholics just told you? Their church does it. Yep. That's perhaps because it's become a liberal Catholic church. See? What about you Orthodox? See? Netta, did you catch it? The Roman Catholics here and the Orthodox, you see what they said? Our churches do it. You know who also catechizes people? You know who also catechizes people? Do you know who else? Who indoctrinates? Because indoctrination can be good or bad. If I indoctrinate you with the truth, that's good. Jehovah's Witnesses, you got it. They too catechize. They don't call it catechesis. But they too catechize their members to be indoctrinated by their beliefs. Amazing, ain't it? All right. With that said, okay. Not to confuse every one of you, let me take the first question again. Okay, let me take the first question again. I was asked, and this is all part of the talk, does the Holy Spirit have a throne or does he share the throne with the Father and the Son? Here, I'm going to let you answer that question. John 15, verse 26. 
John 15, verse 26. I get tired for you guys when I have to talk and repeat myself. I hope I'm not torturing you because I get tired for you guys. Here, John 15, 26. We're going to use the Jehovah Witness Bible. The Jehovah Witness Bible to prove our point. Okay? Here. Pay attention now. Pay attention now. The question is, does the Holy Spirit sit on the throne with the Father? Does he have his own throne? How do you answer that question? Guys, let me explain how we arrive at doctrine. We either will find explicit statements, black and white, that address a specific issue, or we make inferences, we infer, Okay. Sorry, guys. I can't do nothing about the buffering. Okay. Here's how we arrive at biblical truth. How do we know what doctrines we're supposed to believe in because the Bible teaches it? And how do we know the Bible teaches it? Here's how you do it. Pay attention, please. I want to help you. Either because the Bible just comes, comes out black and white and says it, like in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, so you have the Word in God, and the Word was God. My Lord and my God. Right? So you see, black and white. Or we arrive at doctrine by inferences. And inferences is when you look at what the Bible says about something and you make an inference, you infer. Right? For example, an inference would be, I shouldn't do cocaine. But the Bible doesn't mention cocaine. It doesn't have to. What it says about not being enslaved to something, being controlled by a desire other than the Holy Spirit, and destroying your body leads me to the inference cocaine is bad. You understand my point? So not everything is black and white. Sometimes you have to study the Bible carefully and piece all the, the, the verses together on a given subject, see what it says about a subject, and then derive principles, inferences, that will apply to situations not addressed in the Bible. Right? Well, there are things that you must do as a Christian that breaks the law of the land. For example, Scott, the law of the land says you should not condemn homosexuality as an abomination. But the Bible, God says it is. So should I now dishonor God and honor that law? Or do I break the law of the land to honor God's command, which trumps the law of the land? Right? Not all the laws of the land are righteous in the sight of God. Okay, so just follow with me. Now, here's the inference. The Holy Spirit shares the same throne with the Father and the Son. Now, let me answer the question and give you the proof. The Holy Spirit shares the same throne with the Father and the Son. Now, the Bible doesn't come out and say it black and white, but this is an inference that I can make that's faithful to what the Bible does say. Everyone with me? I'm trying to help you learn how to interpret the Bible, how not to interpret the Bible. So if someone says, is there a verse that says the Holy Spirit sits on a throne? No. But can you infer that the Holy Spirit shares the same throne with the Father and the Son? Yes. I can make that inference, but I can't show it to you black and white. For example, if someone says, are we to worship the Holy Spirit and pray to the Holy Spirit? Absolutely. But is there a verse where it says worship the Holy Spirit? No. So then why do I assume and conclude that I can pray to the Holy Spirit, worship the Holy Spirit, because of what the Bible says in regards to the Holy Spirit being God? If the Holy Spirit is a divine person, a member of the Godhead, and God is worthy of worship and praise, that means the conclusion is the Holy Spirit is worthy of worship and praise. See, that's an inference, right? You see my point? You understand? I made an inference and concluded that the Holy Spirit is to be worshipped and praised and prayed to because of what the Bible says about the Spirit being God. God is worthy of worship, praise, and you are to pray to Him. 
The Holy Spirit is God. Conclusion, the Holy Spirit, because he's God, is worthy to be worshipped and praised, and you can pray to him. But the Bible doesn't come out and say, worship the Holy Spirit. Clear? You understand how you arrive at doctrine, how you arrive at biblical truths? Not everything is black and white. Right? With me there? Just want to make sure you're learning how. So if someone says, hey, uh, cocaine bad? Yes. Where does the Bible say cocaine? Doesn't need to. The Bible says I'm not to be enslaved by any desire of the flesh or anything of the world. I can't be controlled by that. I'm to be controlled by the spirit. And I am not to waste money, squander the resources God has given me on foolish things, but I'm to manage the money he gives me wisely for his glory. Right? And I'm not to do anything to destroy my body. So based on those three facts, I arrive at the inference cocaine is bad. Zeli. Zeli, I'm going to ignore you because you've been pontificating. I'm tempted to block you because you mentioned modalism, condemn what that means you're not listening. How in the world would this contradict Sola Scriptura when Sola Scriptura says everything you need for faith and living will be taught in the Bible either explicitly or by necessary inference? Zeli, are you tempting me to block you? Make my day because I want to get rid of all nuisances. Are you tempting me to block you? Make my day because, Zeli, you're obviously not listening because you're talking about uh, modalism condemn 135, you're pontificating. You're all over the map. I'm paying attention to you. Zelly, you know you should go to another channel, right? Zelly, you need to go, right? So would you now make it easy for yourself, leave because I'm going to block you. So you need to go. Bye-bye, so, Zelly. You know, burn incense to Caesar while you're at it. Okay, now, guys, for the rest of you, we're going to pay attention because, see, again, you can see Zully's a snake trying to introduce topics not related to what I'm discussing in order to attack the Protestant principle soul scripture instead of being simply one who listens because you have people here who don't believe in soul scripture. Not that doesn't believe it. You have wrong. And notice I don't get on their case because they're not here to debate that issue, to try to prove I'm wrong and they're right, even though they think soul scripture is wrong. Right? Do you know why? Guys, do you know why those people here in my channel who don't believe in Sola Scriptura? Because they still believe in the primacy of Scripture, and they want to be able to show these truths from the Scriptures because they believe the Scriptures are the voice of God. They don't believe that the Scriptures are the only infallible authority, right? But they do believe it's, it is an infallible authority and that these doctrines must be anchored in the Scriptures. You see? That's why they're eating it up. Ned is eating it up. Oh, yeah, now I got biblical proof for this doctrine. Hallelujah. Yeah. Marcy, this is why I don't want distractions of the devil. Because there's people who are not going to understand. Sola Scriptura. Marcy, let me help this precious sister. Sola Scriptura. These are two Latin terms. You see, again, when you have agents of the devil distracting. See? See? And I go on tangents. Guys, bear with me because I want to help the sister. Sola Scriptura, these are two Latin terms. It means solely scriptures. This is one of the principles, right? One of the principles of the Protestant Reformation. In the 16th century, you had specific Catholics like Martin Luther, who was a Catholic priest, protesting against what they believed to be the corruption of the Roman Catholic Church. They protested. And they argue that whatever the church teaches must be found in the scriptures because the scriptures are the voice of God. They're infallible, inspired, and the scriptures hold ultimate authority. Everything must be subject to the scriptures. You must prove what you believe from scriptures. That was one of the principles of the Reformation. Obviously, the Roman Catholics don't believe that. Orthodox don't believe that. And the Coptics the story, don't believe in Sola Scriptura. They believe in the primacy of Scripture, 
but not that the scriptures alone are the infallible, completely re reliable rule of faith. That is a debate we can have among ourselves in the future. You with me there? But Marcy, do you understand what sola scriptura now means? If you believe in sola scriptura, that makes you part of the Protestant Reformation heritage. Okay? If you believe that. If you believe sola scriptura, then you fall under the camp of Protestant Reformation. You're a Protestant Reform Reformation Christian. Okay? If you believe sola scriptura. If you reject sola scriptura, that means you're not part of the Protestant Reformation. You're not Protestant. You're either Roman Catholic, you're either Coptic, you're either Nestorian, even though I don't like to use the term Nestorian because the Assyrian churches did not believe the heresy of Nestorianism. But put that aside, you're, or you're a Coptic. Okay? You with me there? I'm trying to teach you as much as I can, as simple as I can, by the power of the Spirit, because I want all of you to be scholars of the Bible, warriors of Jesus Christ, spirit-filled, bold warriors, lions, and lionesses of Jesus. That's my goal in these sessions. Okay? But you have people here. Look, I've said it yesterday. I'm going to say it again. You got jerks in every branch of Christianity. You got jerks from the Roman Catholic Church, jerks from the Orthodox Church, jerks from Protestant churches. Jer you got jerks everywhere. And a lot of people think I'm one of those Protestant jerks. Sue me. No, pray for me to be more loving and patient. Okay? So you're going to have people from the Orthodox Church who want to learn another perspective so they can see why the other side believes the way they do. Same thing with Roman Catholics, Coptic. But then you're going to have the jerks among all these camps coming here to start trouble, pontificate, and impress us with their ignorance. Okay? Clear? As you can see, see, I'm hyped up and I'm excited. I don't know why. Okay, coming back to the issue of how we arrive at truth. We arrive at truth by looking to the Bible and seeing what the Bible says on a given subject. Sometimes it'll just be black and white in your face. Don't murder. Don't commit adultery. No sex before marriage. Black and white. Other things are not black and white, but are implicit so that you have to look at a verse here and a verse there and a verse there and combine them and arrive at a correct inference by the power of the Holy Spirit. Right? You understand now? So now, how do I answer this question? Let me repeat, because we're going to go into the eternal beginning. This is all part of it. Hold on, guys. I'm trying to charge my, my computer. Yeah. Come on, man. Man, dude, I got anger issues. My goodness. Lord Jesus, save me from my anger issues, man. I wanted to bust the, uh, the cord. <laughs> Why am I so angry? <laughs> okay, anyway. I was trying to charge my computer. Okay, now. Does the Holy Spirit share the throne with the Father and the Son? Yes. Is there a passage that says that in black and white? No. There is no passage that comes out and says the Holy Spirit shares the same throne with the Father and the Son. So then how do I arrive at the fact that he shares the same throne with the Father and the Son? By necessary inference. So now are you ready for the evidence? Because I wanted to answer that yesterday. It's all part of the discussion. Using the Job Witness Bible to prove the Trinity and the eternal beginning of the Son. Okay, here's how we do it. John 15, verse 26. John 15, verse 26. When the Helper comes, pay attention to the language that I will send you from the Father... The spirit of the truth, which comes from the Father, that one will bear witness of me. Now, question. Jesus said the spirit comes from the Father. I will send him from the Father. Comes from the Father. If the Father is on the throne and Jesus sends the spirit from where the Father is, inference, 
the Spirit is coming from the Father out of His throne in heaven to us. So where is the Spirit? Do you see the inference I made? Is everyone following me before I move on? The Father is on the throne in heaven. Jesus says, when I get there, I will then send the Spirit from the Father out of heaven. But wait, if the Spirit's coming from the Father, out from the Father, and the Father's on the throne, that means the Spirit must be with the Father on the throne. You see how it works? Second line of evidence, John 7, 38 to 39. John 7, 38 to 39. John 7, 38 to 39. Whoever puts faith in me, just as the scripture has said, from deep within him streams of living water will flow. Okay. What or who are the streams of living water? Guys, here's what I need you to pay attention. This is the Jehovah Witness Bible, and we're proving the truth of the Trinity from the Jehovah Witness Bible. Okay, if you believe in Jesus, Jesus will give you streams of living water. Okay, however, he said this concerning the Spirit, ah, which those who put faith in him were about to receive. For as yet there was no Spirit, because Jesus had not yet had not yet been glorified. What it means is, yet the Spirit had not been given. No Spirit means the Spirit wasn't given to believers. Okay, now, guys, help me to help you answer this question. Did John just tell us the stream of living waters, right? The river of living waters are the Holy Spirit. The living waters are not physical waters. The li living waters are the waters of life. That is a metaphor for the Holy Spirit. Right? Right? The streams of living waters... The rivers of the water of life, that is the Holy Spirit. And I can explain why the Spirit is described as water. From the very beginning of creation, you'll see a connection between Spirit and water. Genesis 1-2, and the Spirit of God hovered over the waters. So from Genesis 1-2, we see a connection with the Spirit and waters. Spirit and waters. Water and Spirit. And there's a reason why. Okay, I'll explain it in a minute. Now, remember, the stream of the living waters, the river of the living waters, water of life, that's the Holy Spirit. Now, let's go to Revelation 22, verses 1 to 3. Now, here, Protestant believer, the Joe Witness Bible mistranslates Genesis 1 2. But we'll get to that later. But, Marcy, it's not complicated, right? You're understanding. And if you are, give glory to the Holy Spirit for using me to help you see. Revelation 22, verses 1 to 3. Pay attention now. And he showed me a river of water of life. There you go. According to John 7, same John that wrote the gospel wrote Revelation according to church tradition. A river of water of life, he showed me, clear as crystal, flowing out from the throne, one throne of God and the Lamb. There's your trinity right there, folks. The river of water of life, that is the metaphor for the Spirit. And the Spirit comes out of the one throne of God and the Lamb. So he's right there attached to the throne. He flows from the th throne and is never severed from the throne. There you go. No, Cantanti. Revelation twenty two seventeen doesn't help because it doesn't tell us where the waters are coming from. Did you catch it? Revelation 22, verse 1. One more time. I'm showing you where the water of life comes from. Revelation 22, 17 says, just come and take of the water of life freely. That doesn't tell me where the water of life comes from. That's not going to help your case, Cantanti. But in Revelation 22, verse 1, according to John 7, 38 to 39, the river water of life, that's the Holy Spirit. It's a metaphor for the Holy Spirit. Read with me. And he showed me a river of water of life. Clear as crystal, flowing out from the throne, singular, 
of God and of the Lamb. There's your trinity right there. God and the Lamb, one throne, and from their throne comes the river of water of life, which John tells us in the Gospel of John is simply another way of speaking of the Spirit. So, to answer the question, does the Holy Spirit share the same throne of the Father and the Son? Is He with them on the throne? Yes. Does the Bible say it black and white? No. But it says it by direct and necessary inference. You get it? So, the one who asked me the question, the answer is yes. The Holy Spirit is with the Father and the Son on the throne, and He comes forth from the Father and the Son from the throne to us without being severed from them. Did you notice that the river of the water of life comes from the throne and it never is severed? It's never cut off from the throne. It's constantly flowing from the throne because that river of water of life is inseparable from the throne. You want me there? Did everyone get it? And answering the question, it's now going to bring me back to the eternal beginning of the sun. Okay. Let's go back to John 15, 26 again. I hope you're learning. You see how rich, how deep, how beautiful, profound the Bible is? Because it's the word of the true God. And we're reading about an actual God who actually exists, who's the Father and His Son and the Holy Spirit. And we will actually see them dwell in their presence, be flooded in their infinite love forever and ever. Okay? Now, John 15, 26. John 15, 26. Folks, here's one of the reasons why I conclude that the Spirit proceeds from the Father not from the Father and the Son. Here's where I need you to listen so I don't confuse you. Okay, let's read it again. When the Helper comes, that I will send you from the Father, the Spirit of the truth, which comes from the Father, that one will bear witness about me. Now, number one, Jesus is talking about the Spirit being sent from the Father into the world to bring about God's will. Now, here's, here's two terms I want you to memorize. I want you to memorize the term economic trinity. Economic trinity. Okay. Any monitor that that black stone smooching pagan like this wicked antichrist prophet. If he wants a debate, set it up so I can destroy him and his prophet by the grace of Jesus. Okay. Guys, remember that word, economic trinity. Okay. Thank you, bro. God bless you. No, it's okay. Good. Lord bless you, my man. Okay, economic trinity. And then what's called the ontological trinity. These are terms that scholars came up with to sound intelligent. The ontological trinity means the trinity as they relate to one another in respect to their divine nature. Ontology means nature or being. So when you speak of the ontological trinity, okay, you're referring to Father, Son, and Spirit as they relate to one another before creation in themselves. Anthological trinity is not talking about how the trinity relates to creation. It's talking about how they relate to one another. Their relationship to one another in respect to their divine nature. Do you understand what the anthological trinity is? It means the nature of the trinity. The trinity, as they relate to one another in respect to their nature. The nature of the trinity how they relate to one another as God, irrespective of creation. That's the ontological trinity. When you think ontological, think nature. The nature of the trinity. How they exist within themselves, how they relate to one another, without any reference to creation. Do you understand what the ontological trinity is? Do you understand the term now? Anyone confused, let me know. Okay. So what is the economic trinity? Folks, I'm letting you know. I'm being honest. The kind of information wisdom the Spirit is giving us for the glory of Jesus is the kind of stuff that even some people in Bible college may not be learning. 
thank the Holy Spirit for this wisdom that he's given to us freely without having to go to college or seminary. Thank you, glorious triune God, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Okay. Now, economic trinity. The economic trinity, see, when you think of economic, you're talking about economy, right? The economic trinity is the term coined to refer to the trinity's relationship to creation. The economic trinity refers to the roles, the functions, the work of the trinity in respect to creating and redeeming creation. Yeah, I'm sure. Okay, sorry. Okay. Economic trinity refers to the roles that the trinity assume, the functions that the trinity assume, right, in respect to creation. The roles they took in creating and the roles they took in saving the world. So the economic trinity has to do with the trinity and creation. If there's no creation, we don't speak of an economic trinity. Okay? You understand? You understand the difference between the ontological trinity, economic trinity? In other words, because of creation, the son becomes man. So the father decreed the son would come into the world and become man by the power of the Holy Spirit to save us. And then the father decreed the Holy Spirit would then be sent into the world to convict people that they need Jesus and then bring them to faith in Jesus and then unite them to Jesus and preserve them. That's the economic trinity. But if there was no creation, there would be no need for Jesus to come into the world to become man, and there'd be no need for the Spirit to enter the world to convict sinners and save them. With me there? So you understand the difference between economic trinity. The trinity as they relate to creation Ontological trinity means the nature of the trinity, how they relate to one another. Clear? Intra-Trinitarian relations, extra-Trinitarian relations. Intra-Trinitarianism means the trinity as they relate to one another. Extra-Trinitarianism, right, means the trinity as they relate to creation, outside of their being. Thank you, Phantom. You got it. Thank Jesus for enabling me to make it simple so that we can understand. Amen? You know that's the gift of the Spirit. So I want you to say, thank you, Holy Spirit. We love you, Holy Spirit, for raising up people to make these issues clear as possible. He gets the glory for anything good I do. Anything bad and imperfect, we blame Protestant and first and last. Okay, now, with that said, now, here's where I need you to listen because this is teaching you. You guys are getting a lot of meat in these sessions, okay? You really are. I'm, I'm not just saying it to say it. I'm not tooting my horn, right? May God crucify my flesh, okay? Sometimes you can make an inference from the economic trinity to the ontological trinity. In other words, not always, but there are times in which the roles that the trinity assume in reference to creation gives us an idea of how they relate to one another. In other words, the economic trinity at times, right, can give you an idea of how they relate to one another. You with me there? Not always, but there are times in which you can see that the roles they assume gives us an idea that the reason why they assume the roles is because how they relate to one another. I have no idea what you're saying, Scott. I don't know if you're attacking me again. I know you don't mean to attack me, but you do come off attacking me, right? You, you under, Let me repeat that again. Sometimes in scriptures, we can make an inference how the Trinity relates to one another by the roles they assume in creation for the sake of creation. You with me there? You with me there? You understand? And it's not just learning to save others, Scott. You're learning to know your God, to fall in love with your God, and to live for your God. Because you can't love a God you don't know. You can't love a stranger the same way you love your son or your daughter 
or your spouse. We're growing in our knowledge to get to know God truly as he is to the best of our ability so that we can see how amazing he is, how beautiful he is, how majestic he is, and why he's worthy of our love. The more we know of this God, the more we will fall in love with him if we have the spirit. Okay. Did anyone get confused by what I said that in the economic trinity, you get a glance, a window into how the trinity relates to one another? Right? I can look at the economic trinity, the way the trinity works with one another in bringing about creation and saving creation and make an inference as to how they relate to one another. Okay, if that made sense, I'm going to go back to John 15, 26. John 15, 26. Marcy, you never got this from the Shepherd's Chapel, did you? Right? Now when you're starting to see the truth and the depth of Scripture by the power of the Holy Spirit, Marcy, you see how shallow Arnold Murray's knowledge truly was, right? Exactly, Jonathan Simon. God bless you, brother. Okay, John 15, 26. God bless you too, magnificent prophet. One more time in the Joe Witness Bible. Here is where I'm going to make an inference in regards to the ontological trinity, how they relate to one another. Pay attention to the language. We're going to look at the Jehovah Witness Bible, and we're going to look at the NIV. First, the Jehovah Witness Bible. Thank the admins, the mods, for helping me to help you. When the helper comes, that I will send you from the Father. Pay attention. Send you from the Father. Yes, Phantom, I have a lot of articles on the Trinity on answering Islam. A lot. Okay, but pay attention now, brother, because I want you to see this. I will send from the Father the Spirit of Truth, which comes from the Father. That one will bear witness about me. Now, Jesus is obviously talking about the economic Trinity, the roles they assume, because it's talking about sending the Spirit in creation to bear witness to Jesus to get people saved. But here's where you make the inference to the ontological trinity. Folks, did you notice that when Jesus goes to heaven and sends the Spirit, it's from the Father that the Spirit proceeds, not from the Father and the Son? Let's look at the NIV, John 15, 26. When the advocate comes, whom I will send to you from the Father, the Spirit of truth who goes out from the Father, he will testify about me. So here you have a statement about the economic trinity, how they work in creation to save people, but that also ties into the ontological trinity. Because notice, he comes out from the Father, not the Father and the Son. That's the ontological trinity right there. I will send him from the Father because he comes out of the Father. That's the statement who proceeds from the Father. You get it now? So yes, when it comes to the economic trinity, the Father and the Son send the Spirit in creation to convict people and save them. The Father sends the Spirit through the Son because of the Son, and the Son sends the Father, so the Father and Son together send the Spirit in the world. But where does he proceed from? From the Father. So here we have a statement that talks about the economic trinity and the ontological trinity. You got it or no? Thank you, Medic. I love you, brother. You're getting it, Medic. God bless you, bro. See? Being patient and putting up with me, right? It's going to help you out. And I love you for the sake of the Lord. I mean that. I'm going to give you another one. So here I have a verse that talks about the ontological and economic trinity. The roles they assume leads us to assume something about how they relate to one another. Right? Okay, now. Acts 2, 32 to 33. Jehovah Witness and NIV Bible. We're going to look at both. This is why I, I, you may disagree with me, you may think I'm wrong, you may come with arguments showing I'm wrong, but for now, I have been persuaded when it comes to the deity of the Spirit, it's from the Father alone, 
right? The ontological trinity. So this is why I don't accept the philoke clause. I don't accept it. Now, there are Roman Catholics, Western Christians say, I'm wrong. You should. That's fine. You can agree to disagree with me. That's where I'm at. If I'm wrong, may the Spirit can convict me to show me where I'm wrong, correct it in me, not to repeat it, and save you from all error. Okay? But that's my conviction. That's where I'm at. And I don't know everything, and I'm going to grow in my knowledge until Jesus takes me. But that's where I'm at right now. Okay, now, Acts 2, 32 to 33. Pay attention now. Here the economic trinity and the ontological trinity. Okay. God resurrected this Jesus, and of this we are all witnesses. Pay attention. Jehovah Witness Bible first. Therefore, because he was exalted to the right hand of God, Jesus was exalted to the right hand of God, he received the promised Holy Spirit from the Father. Wow. From the Father. He has poured out what you see in here. NIV. God has raised this Jesus to life, and we are all witnesses of it. Exalted to the right hand of God. He has received from the Father the promised Holy Spirit. He has poured out what you now see in here. Did you notice? Here you have the economic trinity. Jesus pouring out the Spirit upon the church to give life to the church and empower the church to live for Jesus. But notice that he poured it out after he received it from the Father. So it comes from the Father to the Son. He pours it out. Notice the Spirit is coming from the Father. So the economic trinity gives us a window into the ontological trinity. Why is Jesus pouring out the Spirit from the Father? Why is Jesus sending the Spirit from the Father? Because the source is the Father. So here's a passage that speaks to the economic trinity and the ontological trinity. What term? Marcy Lynn. You with me there? What term did you have to Google? You see that works? Making sense? Who got confused here? Who did I lose here? Anyone confused? Come on, help me out, guys. I don't want to move on if I'm confusing anyone. Okay. So let me repeat. There are Roman Catholics and Protestants who would disagree and say, no, the Spirit proceeds from the Father and the Son, not in the economic trinity, meaning the divinity, the deity of the Spirit, right, is from the Father and the Son eternally. The Eastern Church, Orthodox, Nestorian, Coptics, reject that. And I am persuaded that the Eastern Church, Eastern understanding is correct from the Father alone. Now, you can disagree with me and say I'm wrong. That's okay. We can agree disagree, right? Let's Don't attack me. No, you're wrong. This is a debate I'm not here to settle because Christians haven't settled this debate and won't settle it until Jesus returns. But this is what I'm persuaded of on my limited understanding of the Bible, right? Now, with that said, you have Christians who reject this altogether, who don't believe in the eternal procession of the Spirit and don't believe in the eternal beginning of the Son. They say this is outmoded language, outdated language, and the fathers are wrong to use that language, so let's discard it. One of whom is William Lane Craig. You with me there? So... You're going to have three camps when it comes to this. One camp that says, don't speak about eternal beginning of the sun or eternal procession of the spirit. Outmoded language. It doesn't make sense. Let's discard it. Even though for 1900 years, this has been the language of the church. That doesn't mean it's right. But man, you better have good reasons to show why they're wrong, why they all got it wrong and you got it right. You better have good reasons because they can't be wrong. Or you can believe in the eternal beginning of the Son, eternal procession of Spirit, and believe that the procession of Spirit, His deity is from the Father alone, or from the Father and the Son. Those are the three positions. Everyone with me there? Scott, then you got to leave, friend. If you're not here to learn about your God in a corrupt Bible, then you got to leave. So I have to block you from my page and my... Facebook, because there's no point. 
So let me repeat. If you disagree with the spirit proceeding from the Father alone, fine. I'm not here to convince you otherwise. I'm not here to debate you, right? And if you want to reject the language of eternal beginning of the Son, eternal possession of the Spirit altogether, okay, fine. I disagree with you. I believe the church fathers are right. Their view of the relationship of the Trinity was correct. I believe they were illuminated by the Spirit correctly to understand what the Bible says. And I'll go with that. You can disagree with me. As long as you're a Trinitarian, you believe there are three eternal persons always existing as God. And one of those persons became the man Christ Jesus. And you believe he was conceived and born to a blessed virgin by the power of the Spirit without any man touching her. And you believe he died for our sins and God raised him physically and he sits in throne and will return physically to the earth. And the Bible is God's word. You're my brother. You're my sister. Everything else will agree to disagree. Okay. Is that clear? Is that clear? Everyone clear on this? All right. Now, I want to make a final point because we had a Roman Catholic who misunderstood me. Yesterday I said that if you read translations of the Nicene Creed done by Roman Catholics in the West or Protestants, you'll find that they don't translate monogenes as only begotten son. And we looked at a few examples. Now, let me qualify my answer because I didn't want to miscommunicate. Number one, I am not saying that the Roman Catholic Church rejects the eternal begetting of the son. They, they do believe in the eternal begetting of the son because they believe in the creeds. My point was that due to the influence of Western scholarship, specifically Dale Moody, you have now have Roman Catholic scholars who don't believe the Greek word monogenes means only begotten. That was my point. But the Roman Catholic Church affirms the creeds that say Jesus is begotten of the Father eternally. So I wasn't trying to say Roman Catholics discard that. No, they believe in the creeds. They believe that. What I'm saying is due to Western scholarship, Specifically, uh, I believe he was Protestant, Dale Moody. Even Re Roman Catholic scholars are rejecting the understanding that the Greek word, monogenes, means only begotten, which is why in some English translations by Roman Catholics, they'll say, I believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son. But there are other translations done by Roman Catholics, which says, I believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son. That was my point. Is that clear? I didn't want to miscommunicate. Roman Catholics, Orthodox, Nestorians, Coptics, because they all swear by the Nicene Creed, all of them affirm Jesus is the eternally begotten Son of God, begotten of the Father, not created, begotten in eternity. They all affirm it because they believe in the Nicene Creed. The only debate among them is that filioque clause. Roman Catholics in the Nicene Creed say, the Holy Spirit proceeds from the Father and the Son. The Eastern Church, Orthodox and Historians, say no, he proceeds from the Father. That's their only debate when it comes to the Nicene Creed. You have Roman Catholics and now Nada, who's an Orthodox, telling me I'm right. See, they're telling you, I'm doing my best to represent them accurately. Now, before I get into the eternal beginning again, I just want to make sure this is blessing you challenging you, refreshing you, exciting you, and that you're seeing how deep the Bible is, how profound the Bible is, how amazingly deep our God is. So you want to make sure. Everyone with me so far? I didn't lose any of you and then put you to sleep. Okay. Now let's go back. See, here we go. You have another one. Another guy that needs to get blocked. Oh, my goodness. Okay, anyway, let's go back, and I'll address this guy again. A Roman Catholic saying that the version I chose, see, again, the the it was not the one we follow. See, again, as if he's the pope and he pontificates for all Roman Catholics. All right, now, let's go back and look at all the places where this Greek word is used, monogenes. Lord willing, 
if they haven't already done it, either First Lancer or Protestant will put all the links that I gave you yesterday in the description box, even for this video. You have to go back and read those articles and posts showing now that the data, the evidence from the Greek language, the evidence from early Greek writings shows the word monogenes does mean only begotten. Why is that important? If you go back and re-listen, and you got to re-listen to these. You can't just listen to once. You got to re-listen. If you go back and listen to yesterday's session, I said, in the 20th century, a man named Del Moody influenced scholarship in rejecting only begotten as an accurate definition of the Greek word monogenes. He argued that monogenes doesn't mean only begotten. And then someone after named Richard Longeniker confirmed Del Moody's conclusion and argued for the same point Monogenes should not be rendered as only begotten. And because of their influence, majority of scholars shied away from rendering it as only begotten. But thank the Lord Jesus for people like Charles Lee Irons, who went and did an ex extensive, exhaustive search in a database that collected early Greek manuscripts. And he showed that this word, monogenes, and the stem, Genes does mean begetting, birthing. So now he's influenced scholarship to return to the position that the word does mean only begotten, showing that the church fathers who spoke Greek, read Greek, were right, and they were correct in understanding the word monogenes to mean Christ is only begotten. With me there? So don't let scholars tell you this Greek word monogenes does not mean only begotten. It means one and only, the only of his kind, unique. No, it means the one and only begotten, the uniquely begotten. But the word begotten is part of its definition. Don't let them tell you otherwise. Understand? The church fathers stand vindicated. They were right. And the arrogance of people to question their knowledge of Greek. You see, this is the problem with today's scholarship. They think because we have more resources, more information, we're in a better position to know the languages, especially Greek, than the church fathers whose mother tongue was Greek, who, who dreamt in Greek, who spoke in Greek, who read and wrote Greek. I'm not saying we don't have more information than they did. But when it comes to the Greek language, what in the world can you have more than they did when they dreamt in Greek, saw visions in Greek, spoke in Greek, read and wrote Greek? If they didn't get it right, then don't tell me you got it right. See my point? Everyone with me there? Now, I want you to understand why this is an important subject. We're going to compare two translations. King James and NIV, because I'm going to show you where this word monogenes is used, okay, in reference to Jesus. Monogenes is used five times in reference to Jesus. Now, don't post anything yet, Protestant, but I'm going to show you because of Dale Moody and Richard Longeniker, modern versions have been influenced and affected by their conclusions, but thank God, scholarship is now changing. This word monogenes appears... Five times in reference to Jesus. Here it is. I'm going to write it out, and I'm going to mention what, where they're at. Okay? Here it goes. Five times. John chapter 1, verse 14. John chapter 1, verse 18. John chapter 3, verse 16. John chapter 3, verse 18. And 1 John 4, 9. Five times John uses the word monogenes in reference to Jesus. Five times. We're going to compare the King James Version with the NIV to see how they translate the term monogenes in reference to Jesus. Five times, folks. Let's compare, and then we're going to go back to the Jehovah's Witness Bible. So, Protestant, let's start with John 1.14 first. King James and NIV. And thank you, brothers. Thank you, Protestant, for being patient and helping me to help them. Okay, King James. 
And the word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld the glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father. Manogeneos. Manogeneos. Right? NIV. The word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only Son. Begotten is removed from the meaning of the term Manogeneos. Did you catch it? Do you see the difference? Is it only begotten of the Father or one and only Son who came from the Father? Before I move on, do you see the difference? Before I move on. Second example, John 1.18. I hope you're being blessed here, learning more about your Bible versions. Now, there are going to be scholars who are going to attack me and say I'm wrong. That's okay. We'll agree to disagree. John 18, King James versus NIV. No man has seen God at any time. The only begotten Son, the word is monogenes, we use, which is in the bosom of the Father. He had declared him. NIV. No one has ever seen God, but the one and only Son, who is himself God. Now, this is the updated NIV, 2011 edition, right? The 1984 did not say one and only son. It said God, the one and only. This is the updated edition, 2011 of NIV. Okay? But what I want you to see is they still didn't render the word monogenes as only begotten. They rendered it as the one and only son. They dropped the word begotten from its definition. Do you see it? See, I'm going slow with this so it can sink in. Before I move on. Everyone got it? Okay, John 3, 16, King James, NIV. Yep. John 3, 16, King James, NIV. Read with me. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. NIV, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son. Begotten is gone again. Begotten is gone. It's the same Greek words, by the way. It's monogenes and weus. But they drop the meaning begotten as part of the definition of monogenes. Okay, John 3.18, King James and IV. And I hope all of you are listening. Guys, we got over 100. Hit that like button. Come on. I want YouTube to notice me. Let's make this channel explode for the glory of the triune God. Okay. Here, NIV versus King James. He that believeth on him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. NIV. Whoever believes in him is not condemned. Whatever does not believe stands condemned already because they have not believed the name of God's one and only Son. So is monogenes one and only Son, or only begotten Son? Is monogenes, does it mean one and only, or does it mean only begotten? It depends on which scholar you listen to and which version you read. Final one, 1 John 4, 9. King James and NIV. I like, it's nice. King James, NIV, 1 John 4, 9. And this was manifested, the love of God. Here's how God showed his love, demonstrated love for us. Because that God sent his only begotten son into the world that we might live through him. NIV. This is how God showed his love among us. He sent his one and only son into the world that we might live through him. Folks, five times the word monogenes is used of Jesus. Depending on what Bible version you read, It'll either identify him as the only begotten son or the only son or the one and only son. This is why, whether you like it or not, among English-speaking Christians who don't use the King James or the New King James or even the New American Standard Bible and don't go to liturgical churches, you'll rarely find any Christian, especially evangelicals, ever referring to Jesus as the only begotten son. That language is slowly being erased from our vocabulary. 
For you evangelical Christians who go to evangelical churches that don't use King James or New King James, can you tell me when the last time you heard the pastor from the pulpit refer to Jesus as the only begotten Son of God? Which has been the belief of the church for over 1,800 years. When's the last time you heard it? I'm talking about evangelical Christians going to evangelical churches, not independent fundamental Baptists or King James only, or those Christians who still go to liturgical churches that recite the creeds. When's the last time you heard people referring to Christ as the only begotten son? Anyone that goes to those churches? But you can't answer, can you? Right? You see my point? You see what's happening? Slowly but surely over time, the influence of modern scholarship and even versions, and I'm not trying to vilify the versions, we're losing a lot of the historic faith and the language that the church has historically employed to describe the Trinity. It's being erased from our vocabulary, our theology, and our thinking. You get it now? So here's a book you need to get for your library. There is a group of evangelical Trinitarian scholars who are trying to fight for and retrieve the language of the early church fathers. Okay? They are arguing we Christians need to go back to only begotten son, use that language to describe Jesus because the church fathers are right. These are evangelical scholars for the most part. And you know what the name of the book is? You know what the name of the book is? Retrieving Eternal Generation. Here it is on Amazon. Retrieving Eternal Generation on Amazon. And guess what, folks? One of the authors that contributed a chapter is Charles Lee Irons, the man I mentioned yesterday who's now influencing scholarship to return to only begotten as a definition of monogenes. He has a chapter there, and I read it, and it's phenomenal. All of you serious students of the Bible who believe in the eternal begetting of the Son and believe that Jesus is the only begotten Son of God, you need to get this book. Let me give you the link. So thank the Lord we still have English-speaking evangelical scholars that are saying, no, don't reject the language of only begotten as an appropriate definition of monogamous. And the fathers were right. Jesus is eternally begotten and the Spirit eternally proceeds. Let's not lose that language, that heritage. They were right because we find it in the Bible. Mickey, the word in Assyrian is Ichidaya, meaning uniquely born, the uniquely born son, Ichidaya. So far, you with me, right? So far, you with me, right? Now, here's the irony. Here's the irony, folks. Even the Jehovah Witnesses agree the Greek word monogenes does mean only begotten, but they agree for a different reason. So now let's compare the Jehovah's Witness Bible. John 1.14, John 1.18, and the Jehovah's Witness Bible. Now let me show you how dastardly this is, how satanic this is. Why do the Jehovah's Witnesses agree that the word is only begotten? Not because they're Trinitarian, because they're trying to use it to prove Jesus is a creature. Watch here. In their Bible, John 1.14, John 1.18. Watch here. Notice the Jehovah's Witness Bible, folks. They agree. The word monogamous is only begotten. And the word was made flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Wow, Jehovah's Witness. You got it right. Monogamous means only begotten. Now notice John 1.14. Notice how the satanic influence comes in. John 1.18. Jehovah's Witness Bible. John 1.18. Notice the satanic influence. No man has seen God at any time. The only begotten, lowercase g, God. 
Wow. The only begotten, lowercase g, God, who is at the Father's side, is the one who has explained him. This gives you an idea why they want to keep the word only begotten. This gives you an idea. John 3, 16 and 18. John 3, 16 and 18. Jehovah Witness Bible. John 3, 16 and 18. Watch here. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Boy, you got it right. And I notice the word S in son is capitalized. But the word G in God was lowercase. Gave his only begotten son. That it was ever. Why are you giving me the King James, you wicked sinner? For God loved the world so much that he gave his only begotten son so that everyone exercising faith in him might not be destroyed but have everlasting life. Just give me the Joe Wynn Bible. John 3, 18. Yep, lowercase g and only situs. I'm sorry, other situs. They have two diseases, the lowercase g syndrome and the other situs syndrome. John 3, 18, Joe Witness Bible. Whoever exercises faith in him is not to be judged. Whoever does not exercise faith has been judged already because he has not exercised faith in the name of the only begotten Son of God. So wait, Joe Witness, you agree. Monogamous means only begotten. Yes. Do you know why they want it to be only begotten? Because they'll tell you, how can Jesus be eternal if he's begotten of God? When you beget someone, that someone isn't as old as the begetter. The begetter is older than the begotten. So they're using it to prove he's a creature. They're not using it to prove what the church fathers used it to prove. Wow. Yep. Other side is syndrome. And lowercase g syndrome. Now, with all that said, here's what I want to accomplish in these sessions, God willing. So I'm going to have to do a part three. I want to show you the biblical basis for the eternal generation of the Son and then refute the claim that if Christ is begotten, he must be created. Those are the two facts I want to demonstrate from the Jehovah's Witness Bible. And you can use this from any other Bible. But I want to use the Jehovah's Witness Bible to teach you how to then use it against them. Okay, two, two facts I want to establish. Number one, the Bible does teach that Jesus is begotten. But number two, it teaches he's not a creature. So he's begotten, but he's not a creature. You understand what I want to accomplish now? You've gotten enough background information, enough foundation to build on by the power of the Holy Spirit. Okay? You have now enough information, background information, so that we can now build and use even this corrupt translation to prove the Trinity. Clear? Okay. Where do we find the Bible teaching that Christ is eternally begotten? Now, let me define what that means. Begotten of the Father doesn't mean the Father created Jesus from nothing. I like that, Josh. Okay, guys, here's where I need you to learn the definitions. Begotten of the Father doesn't mean Jesus was created. Begotten of the Father means this. This is what it means. Pay attention now. This is what it means. Jesus' deity, his divine essence, is the essence he shares in union with the Father, and the Father is the source of that divine essence. So the early church would say, God the Father is unbegotten, meaning the divine essence that the Father possesses isn't from some other person. It comes from Him. But the divine essence of the Son is the divine essence that the Father is the source of, which the Son shares in eternally and inseparably. So that's why they say begotten, meaning the deity of the Son is from the Father as the source of that deity, but it's just as much His deity as it is the Father because He's inseparable from the Father. Yes, cantante, it is, and I was going to use that as an example. 
Everyone with me there? You understand what it means? It doesn't mean the Father brought him into being. It means that the Father's essence is the essence that the Son possesses in union with the Father because the Father is the source of divinity, of deity, of divine life, divine essence. Right? So now remember the limitation of human language. God in his mercy has condescended to speak in imperfect human language and use limited finite human language to describe an eternal reality. Because we are creatures bound to time, our language is bound to using time elements like before and after, giving and receiving. That's the limitation of human language. But God in his mercy condescends to use such limited language to describe an eternal reality that human language cannot perfectly explain. What I mean there? You're going to understand why I'm sharing this. Because here is a passage that shows the eternal generation of the Son. John 5, verse 26. Jehovah Witness Bible. Exactly, Mickey Friday, you got it. You guys want Wagyu steak? Here you go. Watch here. Watch what's going to happen. Pay attention. For just as the Father has life in himself, so he has granted, given also to the Son to have life in himself. Talk about a passage that's perplexing. Thank you, sheep. God bless you. Talk about a passage that's mind-blowing. Two, two facts from this passage. Here's where I need you to listen now. Two facts from this passage. In the context, to have life in yourself means the Father and the Son, the Son together are the source of life. Life comes from them. The life we enjoy biologically and spiritually comes from the Father and the Son. They have life in themselves, meaning they are the source of life. Source of life, right? Everyone with me there? They are the source of life. With me there? Before I, before I move on. Okay. Now, if you're the source of life, that means you possess life. You don't need anyone to give you life. That's what it means. If you're the source of life, that means you possess life and don't need to receive life from someone else. So it's basically saying the Father and the Son together are self-existent. They don't need anything or anyone outside of their being for life because they possess it within themselves. Right? No, Christos, no. Please don't pontificate or say no. Jesus' human nature cannot be the source of life. Giving life and having life in yourself is a divine attribute, which Jesus possesses even while he's a man. So no, it has nothing to do with his human nature. Jesus has life in himself by virtue of being God. And that life he has, he still possessed even while he was a man. So you can't brush his off side to his human nature because his human nature is not divine. His human nature is sustained by Jesus himself. Even the human nature of Christ needs to be sustained by the life of Christ in union with the Father and the Spirit. So this is not speaking to the human nature of Christ. It's speaking of his divinity, which he still possesses while a man on earth. Because you guys are impatient, you're not you're not getting it. See, Freddy, 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 let me ignore what I'm saying and jump to the answer. Why can't you guys be patient? Help me, please. Help me, please. Okay, so far are you with me? Okay, now here's the question. Are you guys ready for the question? If Jesus has life in himself, like the Father has life in himself, and that means Jesus with the Father is a source of life, and that means if they're the source of life, 
They don't need to be given life by anyone. Then how can the Father give to Jesus life in himself? Isn't that a contradiction? If he has life in himself, he's a source of life. He doesn't need to receive it. But it says the Father gave it to him. Get rid of this filthy dog of the devil. Remember what I said? Because of the limitation of human language, God is going to describe his eternal reality in language that's finite, temporal, and bound to time that cannot perfectly describe this reality. So what did Jesus mean that the Father gave him to have life in himself? It doesn't mean he gave it to him in a moment of time. It doesn't mean he didn't always have it. That's simply the language, Jesus' way of trying to explain, the life I have in myself is the life that the Father possesses, which I share with him in common, in union with him. It's not the language of time. I received it later. It's the language of source. This life I have is his life that he, he shares with me and I share with him in this eternal relationship. Now, can I prove that to you? Are you now ready for me to prove to you Jesus always had life in himself, so it was never given to him in time? Are you ready for the proof? Are you ready for the proof? Okay. John 1, verses 1 of 4, Jehovah Witness Bible. John 1, verses 1 of 4, Jehovah Witness Bible. Pay attention now. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was a God. Forget that butchering of the Greek. It's okay. Let's go with it. He's a God. All right. What kind of God is he? Pay attention to their translation. This one was in the beginning with God. Now, here's where I really need you to listen. I honestly need you to listen. If, you, if there's a time to listen, it's now. All things came into existence through him, the Word. And apart from him, not even one thing came into existence. What has come into existence by means of him was life, and the life was the light of men. Okay. Notice what you just read in the Job Witness Bible. All creation was brought into existence through the word. That means the word was existing before all things were created. Well, if the word was existing before all things were created, the word existed eternally. Because he was there before all creation, right? Right? Everyone got it? Even in their Bible. All things came into existence through the Word. The Word was there with God. And God used the Word to bring all things into existence. All creation into being. Well, hold on. If the word brought all creation into being, that means he was there before all creation. But what do you have before all creation? Timelessness, eternity. The word was there in eternity, and he brought it into being. But then catch the second part. Let's read John 1, 3, and 4 again. God bless you too, brother. Thank you. Thank you guys for your support. Now I just got to learn how to collect from Super Jeff. Thank you, Jojo Mom Momster. But here's where it gets exciting. Read the last part. All things came into existence through him, and apart from him, not even one thing came into existence. What has come into existence by means of him was life. Understand what you just read. The word in eternity was the one who gave life to creation and made creation alive. Folks, how could Jesus give life to creation, make creation alive, if he didn't already have life in himself before creation? Catch it? So, did Jesus have life in himself before all creation? Yes. If he had life in himself before all creation, was there a time in which he didn't have life in himself? He always had it. Always had it. But then how could he say the Father gave it to him? Because the giving isn't time. The giving is simply Jesus' way of communicating an eternal reality. 
The life I have in me, I've had in eternity, but it's the life I have in me that is from the Father, which I possess in union with the Father. This is why the early church believed in the doctrine of the eternal begetting of the Son. Yep, exactly Bible feast. You see why I agree with the church fathers? They were right. Now you're going to have evangelical scholars trying to say, no, that doesn't mean that. William Lane Craig says it doesn't mean that. You're reading too much. Stephen Hayes, hey, more power to them. We'll agree to disagree. Those who want to believe you, fine. But I see that the church fathers were right. Did you catch it? John 1 says, okay, John 1 says, before all creation was made, Christ the Word had life in himself. And that's the life he gave to the world and made creation alive by that life. So, Lord, you had life in yourself before creation? Yes. So that means you had life in yourself eternally? Yes. So then how could you say the Father gave it to you? And the Lord would say, I believe he'd say this. I don't want to speak presumptuously. Lord have mercy. Who told you he gave it to me in time? I've always had it because I've always been with him. I've always been one with him. So his life in him is my life in me. The life in me is the life in him that I share in union with him eternally and inseparably. Welcome to the wonderful world of the eternal generation of the Son. Cantante, you know you're killing me with those questions, right? You're killing me. Even if it's through him, what does that mean? If it's in him, what does that mean? It means God used Jesus to bring creation to being. So even if it's through him and in him, right, that means he has to have been there before creation for it to come through him and in him. With me there? Okay. So even if we say God created through the Son, all right, but that means the Son was still there before all creation, so you still end up with the Son being eternal. And through Him simply means God did it with the Son and the Spirit. The Father didn't do it alone. But according to the Old Testament, Jehovah God did it alone. Jehovah alone created all things. But if the Father created by using the Son and the Spirit, and yet only Jehovah did it, then you end up with the Son and the Spirit also being Jehovah, one with the Father, or you have a contradiction. So throw in irrelevant, splitting hairs, trying to avoid the clear implication of all creation coming through the Son. Here, I'll, I'll give you an example. A very bad example, right? Netta and her husband go to the bank account, joint account. Her husband takes out money, and he sends you money through Netta, and Netta gives you the money. Does that mean because the husband sent money to you through Netta, it wasn't Netta's money? It's her money. It's a joint account. The husband withdrew it and said, Netta, give this $100 to Cantante because he's Greek. Although he's an ugly-looking Greek, he's still Greek. Tikanis kasikala. That still means it's her money that she shares in common with her husband. So though he took it out, it came from him through her, it's still her money nonetheless. No, I said you're an ugly Greek. I don't know if you're a brother or a sister. I don't get it. But. Now I can multiply these examples. Though they're poor analogies, I still can multiply. I can say... Not and her husband own one car. The title is in both of their names. They own that car, right? And he says, honey, here's the keys. I want you to take the car because my dad needs to use it. So now Netta's husband sent his car through Netta to her father-in-law, but that car is also hers that she shares in common with her husband. You get my point? I can go on and on and on with these analogies. This is simply a desperate, pathetic attempt of denying the obvious. If the Father created through the Son, that means the Son was also responsible in creating, and He was there before creation. 
So you still end up with the same point. You get my point? But anyone, everyone got the point I was trying to make here. Okay. If Jesus had life in himself, even before creation, and he's the one who gave life to creation and made it alive, that means Jesus eternally existed with life in himself. Even in eternity, Christ had life in himself. That's the plain reading of John 1, verses 1 to 4. So when did he receive life in himself if he already had it in eternity, which is why then he could give life to all creation? When did he receive it? When did he receive it? Someone help me. When did he receive it? So he always had it. So then Jesus, why do you say the Father granted that life in me? Because Jesus is saying, human language is limited, finite, imperfect. So I'm explaining an eternal reality beyond your comprehension so you can get an idea. And I'm using language to describe what cannot be perfectly described because of the limitation of your language. The granting doesn't mean I didn't have it. It means the life I have in me is the same life in the Father that I share with them eternally, who is the source of life. That's all it means. That's all he's trying to say. Everyone got it? Did it sink in? Because I had to make a final point. We're going to have to do a part three tomorrow. Yeah. Because phantom, whether you like it or not, our language is bound by time. We can't help but talk about time elements and when we describe events because we're bound to time. We're bound to creation because we're creatures. Creation's bound to time. We can't avoid expressing actions in reference to time sequence. We can't avoid it. So this is the problem. Try to describe an eternal being, an eternal reality that transcends time adequately. Thank you, Freddie. I love you, Freddie. I want to kiss your head. You grant that we're both humans, but did you grant that in time? <laughs> Perhaps, medic. But remember, still, the hypothetical perpetual motion machine, that's still part of creation. Quarks are still part of creation. There were no quarks before creation. Right? Clear? Now, one final proof tonight, one final proof tonight for eternal generation. Yep. One final proof tonight for eternal generation. And it's been smacking you in the face all this time. It's right there in front of you, and you've read it hundreds of times, but may have not seen the connection. John 1.1 1, 1 and 2. Well, John 1.1. 1, 1. It's right there. It's right there. Hit you in your face. John 1.1, 1, 1, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was a God. Forget that a God stuff. I'll get to that later. It's right there, folks. Right there, the first verse of John 1 is talking about eternal generation. Note, Jesus is the Word of God the Father. Who is the source of the Word? My words originate from me. I'm the source of these words. So if Jesus is the Word of the Father... That means the Father is the source of that word. Even though the, the term word is metaphorical in that it's describing Jesus' role as the revealer of God, still it conveys the fact that it's Jesus who re reveals the Father because he is of the Father, sent from the Father to reveal the Father, and because he has the nature of the Father, he's able to perfectly describe the Father. So being the word of God, there's that language of source again. Is Jesus the word of the Father or is the Father the word of Jesus? The Father is not the word of the Son. The Son is the word of the Father. Implication, the Father is the source of that word. Because the word originates from him. You catch it? Right there, it's been hitting you in your face. So the Father is not the word of the Son. And the Son doesn't send the Father to reveal Him. The Father sends the Son because the Son is the Word 
of the Father, whose role it is to be sent to reveal the Father in union with the Holy Spirit. Right there. It's been right there, man. It's been there all along, John 1. But now my question, has the Father ever been wordless? Has the Father existed without his word? Or has the Father always existed with his word, even though he's the source of the word? He's always existed with his word. Welcome to the wonderful world of the eternal generation of the Son. You see why the church fathers are right? And don't let anyone, not even a William Lane Craig, tell you otherwise. The church fathers were right. The Holy Spirit gave them illumination into the eternal reality of the Trinity. It is a shame we're losing that truth. Let's reclaim it. Let's proclaim it because it's biblical. At least that's what I believe. Yes, guys, if you want, you can support me on my Patreon pages or even on my PayPal link. I can use the support to do full-time ministry if the Lord puts it in your heart. Pray God will provide overabundantly for my daughter's sake. I move into my new place. By Monday, I'll be there. Pray for prov prov provisions, for health, for safety for my daughters and I, that he'll bring them into my life. And guys, I want you to covenant with me and fast. Miraculous deliverance from that corrupt system in Chicago. And also tomorrow for miraculous favor, tomorrow in the morning, 8.30, that God will give me favor with the locals here, that they'll work with me and see Jesus in me and not put any constraints on me. I need a favor tomorrow, right? Because things can mess up. Pray against that, that the Lord will open a door blessing and give me favor and keep me here. Pray my daughters come to me sooner than later. And guys, also, I'm going to mention it because I believe God answers the prayers of his people. And I may not be walking as closely with the Spirit as I should, so my prayers are hindered. But I know there are you, some of you here that are walking closely with the Spirit, and your prayers will be answered. I'm not trying to teach a faith and works-based salvation system, but it is true. If you're in sin, then your prayers are hindered. The more you walk by God's grace and you do with the Spirit, the more powerful your prayers. So I trust there are people here who are powerful in their prayers. Because God answers. So please covenant with me to pray and fast. Miraculous deliverance. God's preserved the money he's given me. That he don't take it away. The Lord keeps me safe. Brings my daughters to me that I can pray. This man has to go. Pray for my daughter's mother, Michelle. God will be a fire in her heart and bones. Breaking her to repent of her morality. To keep men away from my daughters. If she wants to be with men, keep them away. Ask Jesus to keep men away from influencing my daughters especially this man she's with, and I'm going to give you his name because it's about my girls. I don't care about him. May God save him, but he's in their life and shouldn't be. In fact, just to tell you how nasty it can be, she'll even send me text messages saying, oh, Martin loves them and they love Martin to dig the knife deeper in my heart because she knows I ache for them. Pray, Lord Jesus, this man must go. Martin Simon Yako, that's his name. Martin Simon Yako, you must go in Jesus' name. They're my daughters. Keep him away and be a fire in her heart to break before your feet, Lord Jesus. My daughters need me, not this man. What a low thing and a nasty thing to say and a satanic thing to say to a father who adores his daughters, whom hasn't seen them since June. Oh, he loves them and they love him. And to get nasty with me, Saturday she goes to work and she tells me, Oh, Martin is coming. He's going to watch them with his son, knowing that's the dagger in my heart. But because of Jesus, he's kept my heart at peace, filled with his love and joy. Martin Simon Yaku must go, and the Lord in his mercy protect them. Okay? That's the struggles I'm going through. Pray for a favor tomorrow so that I'm free so I can come and serve you. Part three. Part three on the eternal beginning of the sun. But I hope it blessed you. I hope it blew your mind away. I hope you saw how deep and beautiful the Bible is and how beautiful and amazing the God of the Bible is. Because the God of the Bible is real. The Father lives. The Son lives. The Holy Spirit lives. And Jesus is coming, hopefully sooner than later. Keep us in love with you, Lord Jesus. Wash us in your blood and fill us with your spirit. We love you, Father, Son, and Spirit. Christ is risen, risen indeed. In Jesus' name, amen. Take care.